pleasure to introduce you Sara Han from uh, the Rubik University in Bochum. Uh, she's working on topics that are very relevant and connected to our project. So for instance, the topic that she's going to talk today, she's working on uniqueness of logical connectives and bilateralism, among <coughs> other things. And today she's going to talk about how to secure uniqueness of logical connectives in bilateralism or multilateralism. So, on your side. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you have to tell me where I should stand. You're good, you're good, okay. you're good. Yeah, no, you're fine. You can, you can walk around, you're fine. <laughs> um, yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much um, yeah, uh, to your group uh, for inviting me here. I was very glad this invitation, especially because you're still doing this in person, it's uh, nice. Yeah, and, uh, as you can see, this will be a topic of my talk. I will probably explain this a bit more in detail, um, but just in general, so background question here is um, about uniqueness of connectives, which is the question whether a connective is characterized by the rules governing its use in a way that there is at most one connective then playing this specific uh, inferential role. I will, but I will explain this in more detail later. And uh, the problem I want to talk about here is um, yeah, that in a bilateral uh, proof system, this, um, the usual notion uh, that's usually considered for uniqueness does not suffice. So this is the plan for the talk. Um, I want to present, present you a bilateral sequence calculus system for um, bi-intuitionistic logic, 2 int, um, and then dis um, discuss some general settings in which uniqueness can fail. Then show the specific problem of bilateralism uh, and how they relate to the uniqueness related problems that have been detected so far. Um, and I want to propose a solution uh, on how we can uh, still guarantee uniqueness in uh, bilateralism. Show that these considerations could be a guidance um, on questions about um, representations of proof systems, so a bit like. Um, there might be this or that way, and uh, you could argue that this way is a better way of representing a proof system than another. And really, in the end, just hint at possible extensions of these results to multilateral proof systems. Mm. It sounds like a lot, but um, I was told that uh, I have an hour, so this is also a lot, so <laughs> we will see. But <laughs> okay. Um, background, bilateralism and proof theoretic semantics. Um, now I'm kind of glad that I have these slides because at first when I prepared the talk I thought it was really only people who work with bilateralism and now I was told no, um, the audience is a bit more uh, like broader, um, so this may be uh, good. Mm. So these are some definitions of bilateralism in the literature. It uh, all started Stuff, but this specific term stuff with uh, Ian Rumford's uh, yes and no paper. They say um, that uh, yeah, affirmative answers, however, enjoy no priority over negative ones. The acts of answering a propositional question affirmatively and of answering it negatively, the acts of accepting its content and of rejecting it, are conceived to be on or false. I shall call this view of how sentences sense might be specified the bilateral conception in contradistinction to the unilateral conception. And for example, um, in a paper by Nissen Francis he says bilateralism is an approach to meaning taking denial as a primitive attitude on par with assertion. Or um, then this comes from a different uh, run of bilateralism from Dave Ripley, saying that bilateralism, a particular form of inferentialism defended in Rumford and Restall, is the view that which inferences are valid is itself to be explained in terms of conditions on assertion and denial. Or bilateralism holds that we must consider conditions governing the speech acts of assertion and denial for bilateralism to, be gen to genuinely be by it must hold that denial conditions cannot themselves be understood as deriving uh, only from assertion conditions. Our Leeds Kürbis um, bilateralism, which proposes a wholesale revision of what it is that, it, uh, that is assumed and manipulated by rules of inferences and deductions, 
rules apply to speech acts, assertions and deniers rather than propositions. Give you an idea what is conceived of by um, bilateralism. And what most of these um, definitions have in common. Um, try to um, so there's a reference to speech acts of assertion and denial, and it's emphasized that these notions uh, have kind of symmetry, they both are primitive, they are not reducible to each other, they are on a par. And another point that is often mentioned in this context is that um, in bilateralism, rejection and or denial uh, are considered as conceptually prior to negation. So denial of a formula is not interpreted um, in terms of, uh, or it is not interpreted as the assertion of the negation of this formula, but rather the other way around. Okay, and uh, Ripley then distinguishes two kinds of bilateralism. I found this quite helpful because um, there is definitely a, dif a difference in the literature and um, he uh, really uh, made this distinction uh, clear for the first time, I think, uh, to say, okay, there's, on the one hand, there's this, what he calls warrant-based bilateralism, which takes relevant conditions to be the ones under which propositions can be warrantedly asserted or denied. And this then motivated, this, this is what Rumford did, um, a proof system of natural deduction with assigned formulas for assertion and for denial. And Rumford <coughs> this up on these papers were by Price and Smiley rejection. Okay, and the other form would be the coherence-based bilateralism, um, which takes uh, the realm conditions to be conditions under which collections of uh, propositions can be coherently asserted or denied together. And this motivates then a specific kind of reading of a sequence calculus. And I'm actually not really sure, I know that you work with bilateralism, I'm not really sure in which direction your bilateralism will go. Mm, maybe you can tell me later. Mm, so this reading of the sequence calculus uh, then would be uh, to read the, um, to say, uh, the left part uh, cannot be asserted while the right part of the sequent sign is denied together. So this is why this is, these collections are to, um, together then. Okay, and now I told you about these conceptions of bilateralism just to tell you that um, our notion, and when I say our, um, yeah, maybe the Bochum notion, because it's, um, uh, it started with my PhD supervisor, uh, Heinrich Wansing, I would say, um, yeah, working in the same direction, so uh, that's why our. Mm, um, so, we do not consider bilateralism to be about speech acts mm, because, yeah, um, I mean, the context of bilateralism is of course proof theoretic semantics, so saying that the meaning of the connectors is given by uh, yeah, the rules governing um, yeah, their use. Mm, so we're considering uh, this in this proof context not to be about speech acts um, per se, but more to be about other notions which should be considered on a par like proof and refutation, provability, refutability, you could also say, or verification, falsification. And yeah, if you do this, then you can see proof theoretic semantics not only as a study of proofs, but also of something that Heinrich um, I think calls dual proofs. Mm. Tell you in a minute what is it's meant by this. But the thing is then you get um, a duality between um, different inferential relationships. So the thought is to implement bilateralism deeper than on the level of formulas. Uh, so you don't have um, side formulas, but to have uh, this bilateralism on uh, yeah, the um, derivability relations in a proof system. And then, yeah, you get two notions of logical consequence, our usual consequence relation capturing the notion of verification from premises to conclusion, and a dual counterpart capturing the notion of falsification from premises to conclusion. And this has um, been devised in uh, Van Zing's natural deduction system for a bi intuitionistic logic to it. And this natural deduction system 
uh, comprises introduction and elimination rules, both for proofs and for dual proofs. Show you here an example. Um, so the upper line is. I guess familiar for everyone, it's just the usual natural induction used for conjunction. Mm. And here we have single lines for proofs, mm. and the other uh, part, these would be the dual proof rules for conjunction, and we use double lines for these. And as you can see, these look very much like the ones for that you know for disjunction, right? So this is basically the way um, this proof system it was captured um, by taking the dual connective of conjunction with disjunction and just uh, replace single by double lines and then you get the dual proof rules for <coughs> conjunction. And you read this just um, as saying from, from a refutation of A you get a refutation of A and B. Yeah, or um, yeah, same for B of course. And um, the other uh, thing is that you have two parts of assumptions, namely assumptions taken to be true, which is gamma here, and delta is supposed to be uh, the counter assumptions taken to be false, mm, and single square brackets for discharge and double square brackets um, uh, for discharge of counter assumptions. Then um, I don't have more. <coughs> I think. Um, the handout with the proof rules was distributed to you, so if you want to mm, take a closer look at this. Um, I tried to come up then with an equivalent single calculus system for this natural reduction system, and this can be shown to be um, cut free. So for the natural reduction calculus, uh, I think Wanzing showed um, normal form uh, theorem, so cut elimination here. Okay, this would be a slightly uh, stronger result even. And here we have two consequence relations um, denoted by this sequence of signs with plus and minus. And yeah, sequence are of this of this form where you also have the um, two parts of the assumptions uh, on the left side of the sequence, and then a sequence that is signed with plus or minus. And these would be, for example, the um, uh, rules for conjunction. Again, the upper line is basically. Um, what you are familiar with, and uh, the lower line would be then the dual proof rules in sequence calculus. Mm. The thing is now here, within the right introduction rules, we have to distinguish between different um, derivability relations of uh, verification and falsification. Um, within the left introduction rules, this is not necessary, but we have to distinguish uh, here whether a formula is introduced into the assumptions or into the counter assumptions. That's why uh, these have these superscripts A and C. Um, yes. And yeah, the following structural rules can show to be admissible in the sequence calculus. Um, of course, here we need then two parts. We need two weakenings. We need two contractions. We need two cuts. Uh, because, yeah, for example, you can weaken into the assumptions and into the counter assumptions, and the same for contraction and so on. Mm. And these are then our um, proof and dual proof rules in the second calculus. We have um, also two zero, uh, so um, two uh, re the reflexive rules. Uh, because we can uh, say from the assumption we can verify uh, from the assumption that p we can verify that p from the counter assumption p we can falsify uh, that p. So we basically need just double the amount of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, these would be the rules for um, disjunction. And as you can also see here, the lower line are the dual proof rules, and they are again basically the dual, um, so, so like the mirror of the conjunction, uh, of the positive conjunction rules basically, right? So here you say, if you have a uh, falsified that A and falsified that B, then uh, you can falsify that A or B, is the case. Mm. 
And um, here we have the Im implication rules, now a natural deduction system. And this is uh, one thing I, I told you before, how, uh, how do you come up with the dual proof rules for, um, for the conjunction where you take the ones from disjunction, right? And then you do dualize them. But for implication, we, don't, we usually don't have a dual connector. Um, here we do, I will show you in a minute. Um, but still, okay, what does it mean to falsify it, so to introduce um, the refutation of A implies B would be to say you have a proof of A and a um, refutation of B. And if you have a refutation of <coughs> A implies B, then you can prove from that A or you can refute B. These are the rules of secret calculus. They are also just about the same. Very interesting. Now a quick detour about co-implication. I just told you here we have a dual connective. That's why it's a bi-intuitionistic logic. Um, we call this connective co-implication. In the literature, it also goes by names like um, sub subtraction and um, the other ones now are the other one I forgot. Maybe we'll think of it later. Um, and sometimes also different signs I use, so it's a bit of a mess in the literature, but um, it is okay. It's uh, supposed to be a um, dual connected to implication. And the thought is that this is desirable to have uh, in a bilateral uh, system. First, before I tell you why, I will show you um, yeah, what the rules are so that you know what it's about. Um, so again, the, these are just the rules for implication, and then you can see how they are. They just lead to the dualized rules. Mm. So, to if you want to introduce, uh, we read it the other way around. So, B coinflates A. You have to have a proof of A and a refutation of B. So basically, uh, what you had to uh, to refute uh, the implication. And um, yeah, from a, from B from a proof of B plus A, you can get a proof of A or also a refutation of B. And uh, okay, and these are the rules for sequel calculus. Um, but yes, anything interesting about them to say? No, oh, I think later there will be more interesting things to say. Um, so. Why is, it, um, why is it desirable in a bilateral system to have this? Because both, you can say that both implication and co-implication can be understood to express then certain concepts of entailment in the object language. And if we take falsification just as um, important as verification, then this might be desirable because in our normal uh, case we have it that uh, we have this implication to capture this um, entailment relationship. We have a derivation of A in place B, if and only if there is a derivation from A to B. And here we have the same thing. We have a dual derivation of B in place A, if and only if there is a dual derivation. So falsifying analysis leads to falsifying the conclusion from B to A. So if we say we want to take this falsification from premises to conclusion seriously, then it makes sense to also have uh, this in the object language. Okay, that was about um, this bilateralist um, system, about this bi-intuitionistic logic. Um, I didn't say this before, but um, if you hear bi-intuitionistic logic, maybe you think uh, rather of the more well-known bi-intuitionistic logic, hiding the hiding brower logic. They also have this co-implication, mm, but it may be yeah, important to mention that you have the same sign there, but the interpretation is different. So in Heisenberg logic, co-implication is interpreted as um, preserving non-truth from conclusion to premises uh, in a valid inference. Here, co-implication is said to uh, preserve falsity, not non proof but falsity, from premises to conclusion in a dually valid inference. Just to mention this. Now about this thing of uniqueness. Mm. So
So, this was, um, I call it here, um, the overlooked condition because um, it was introduced by Bernab in his famous response to the Prior's tongue problem. Um, so, I don't know how much uh, everyone knows about tongue. Uh, so, the question was okay, what requirements must rules for connectives meet in order to be meaning conferring? Um, and Bernard's solution, because okay, um, because Prior's tongue problem was then to say, okay, I can also <coughs> give you a nonsensical connective and just say, well, this, these are the rules and this is then the meaning or what, but um, this, uh, yeah. He wanted to make the point you cannot just give any rules, there have to be some requirements for the rules. And okay, Bernard then said, yes, I will give you some requirements. We have to demand conservativity um, of extensions. Mm, yeah, so, um, yeah, that if we extend our language with certain connectives, then that should basically not mess up the system, it should not trivialize the system, and so on. This was the answer to the existence issue of connectives, and then he says on basically like in one paragraph he says, okay, and if we have settled this existence issue, so is there such a connective, then we can ask, okay, and is it uniquely characterized by the rules? And yeah, this is then the question. When is a logical connective uniquely determined by its rules? Mm. And in general, okay, if the rules that define it permit at most one inferential role for this connective to play. So there cannot be two connectives characterized by the same set of rules, but otherwise playing um, different roles in inference. This should not happen. And this should definitely not happen if we consider something like proof theoretic semantics. Um, that would be bad. Mm. And the question is now, okay, how can we check this? Uh, okay, we say um, we build a copycat connective of uh, that connective, which is defined by exactly the same rules. Um, and the connective then is uniquely determined um, yeah, if they play exactly the, role, uh, the same role, both in premises and conclusion. <coughs> and how can we test this? Uh, then usually, um, interoperability is then taken as the, uh, so Bernard um, said with his assumptions for a proof system, he said this is then the qualifying criteria. We must be able to show that we can derive one from the other and the other way around, basically. If that is the case, then it is uniquely determined. And we see here for conjunction, for example, okay, this is very unproblematic, we can show if we consider this conjunction prime to be defined by the same introduction and elimination rules, then we can just, um, yeah, there's this interoperability, no problem. And Bernard's counter example was, was this clock and plink. So we, he said, okay, we can consider two connectives, uh, which are both specified by just one rule, namely that we can derive from, from B, A plot B, and from B, we can also derive A thing B. And given only these rules for Planck, we cannot show that Planck is unique mm, because, mm, I mean, there's, there's no way to show this interoperability, right? You can go from B to A plot B, and then you stop. You have no, no elimination rule or something like this, so you cannot get rid of it, you cannot get to A plot B, so the same for Planck. So, um, yeah, this is uh, impossible, and thus Bernard says they, um, they could, in theory, stand for different connectors. And now, this was uh, the beginning of this, and then there was not that much literature on uniqueness, I would say, but um, especially Lloyd Humberstone is one of uh, the people who have, uh, worked a lot uh, on this, and we all know. When he writes something, he writes very extensively about this. So all these papers are <laughs> 80 pages or something like this, or the 2000 Elvis, of course, this book on connectors. And, um, but he gives very interesting examples. So because he doesn't 
give only these like made up like plonk and pink examples, but um, from actual logics which we use otherwise, um, he shows that there can be a failure of uniqueness. Um, and for, what he emphasizes is this um, that it's really system dependent. Mm. So one of his examples is um, yeah, box in system K or negation in FDE. Um, he says, okay, what does or does not uniquely characterize a connected <coughs> is a set, uh, set of rules, of course, and a collection of rules of a system are in turn should be seen as conditions on consequence relation. And then he shows that a failure of uniqueness can occur due to, for example, just different ways of formulating a proof system. Or, and this would be um, for my talk um, important, um, due to non concurrentiality or impure rules. I will say in a minute what this is about, but just about this um, first thing. So he shows um, that uh, the, whether we have rules or axioms, so zero premise rules uh, plays a role, um, or the number of formulas on the right side of the sequence side, for example, can make a difference. Um, he uses as an example, for example, this junction is not uniquely characterized in uh, the, the classical intuitionistic rules when they are formulated as zero premise rules. Mm. Or negation and minimal logic cannot be uniquely characterized by uh, set formula rules where there's exactly one formula on the right side of the sequence sign, but it is uniquely characterized if we say there's at most one formula on the right uh, sequence sign. Mm. Just to give you an example of, yeah, there's really weird stuff going on there. But uh, yeah, about well, congruentiality in tsunami, um, uh, it's not only uh, this connected to uniqueness. So, we say that a consequence relation is congruential if for all formulas, whenever A and B are interderivable, then, by the way, then we say they are equivalent. Um, whenever they are interderivable, um, they are also. Uh, when they are integrated into more complex formulas, these formulas then are also interderivable. Then, if that is the case, then we can say that A and B are synonymous. Okay, and we say that the logic is congruential if the defined consequence relation in it is uh, congruential. And then Humberstone says, okay, and then we have to distinguish between uniqueness to within equivalence and uniqueness to within synonymy. Um, the stronger notion would be then the interdrivability of all compound formulas containing the connective. And so in congruential logics, uniqueness to within equivalence or uniqueness to within synonymy uh, yeah, coincide. Um, in non congruential logics, this makes a difference whether we want this or that. And just quickly about impure rules. Um, rules are said to be impure, or sometimes we say, um, Say they are uh, inseparable. Um, that's another um, term for this. Um, when more than one connective uh, occurs within the rules, and usually, also from a proof theoretic semantics point of view, this is something that might be considered um, problematic because we want to say that the rules define the connective, and um, if more than one occurs, then there will be some circularity, probably. Okay. So, and then Hammerstone says, if this is the case, then we can only say that um, the rules um, characterize the connective uniquely in terms of this other connective, which also occurs. Uh, and an example for this uh, would be Nelson's um, constructive logic of strong negation in four, which is a paracomplete and paraconsistent um, Extension of FDE basically, um, and I chose this because there's yeah a relation strong relation between N4 and this logic two, and I told you before um, that if we add strong negation to two and this could be yeah read as a toggle. This would lead us directly between um, 
from proofs to view proofs and the other way around. Um, so and in, in usual unilateral calculi, uh, uh, the rules for strong negation are impure. Uh, so Doug Kravitz uh, gives in his um, natural reduction uh, book, he gives uh, rules for and for and they are impure. Mm. So the question here that could only be asked is then, um, is the strong negation, is it uniquely characterized by its rules in terms of, and then contraction and implication because these uh, also occur in the rules for strong negation. And four is also non congruential because uh, for um, equivalent replaceability in all contexts, provable equivalence is not enough. What is additionally needed to secure this is uh, an equivalence between the strongly negated formulas. So here's an example. Um, these two formulas are equivalent in this uh, system of N4, but if you put a strong negation sign in uh, before them, they are uh, not. Yes. So, in this case, for N4 now, we have a non congruential logic, and like I told you before, in non congruential logics, we have to demand then uniqueness to within synonymy to get real uniqueness. Um, but uniqueness would have to be uh, tied to strong negation here because the interdrivability uh, between strongly negated formulas would need to be the additional requirement. But strong negation can only be defined in terms of other connectors because the, of the impure rules. So this uh, leads to some... Sorry, uh, a question for clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and thus, the first uh, point, I don't get the sentence, uniqueness to within, synonymy must be demanded. Is that a technical term within synonymy? Mm -hmm. Uniqueness to within mean? synonymy is the technical term. Okay. Uh, we can what it mean? mean? No. What it means? Exactly. The cover stone. Uh, oh, yeah. Ah, yes, oh, so yes, 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 yes. Uh, uniqueness to within equivalence yes, and sorry, uniqueness yeah, yeah. to within synonymy. And this would be the interdrivability of all compound okay. formulas. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, if you have any questions, no problem with being uh, interrupted. Um, Yeah, and now for the problems for uniqueness in a bilateralist system. I want to show now what those are and that they are quite similar to the ones I just mentioned for and for, but that I think here we can uh, give a, a, a more elegant solution. So what causes trouble in a logic like 2int mm, is that we have these two sets of rules and two consequence relations. So we could think that on one hand we have the proof rules and we have the dual proof rules and we have a relation for approvability and for dual approvability. So and if we think about what Hammerstam said about collection of rules um, should be read as conditions and consequence relations, we could think that proof rules generate the consequence relation for approvability and the dual proof rules the one for dual approvability. Um, the thing is now that the connectors of 2int are already uniquely characterized on three for both consequence relations individually by only a part of their set of rules. So let me show you what I mean. Um, if we take this, so this test for uniqueness, whether it's to a, within equivalence or synonymy is now irrelevant, mm, is always some kind of interdrivability. And we can show now that we get this, um, if we take conjunction prime again to be um, defined by the same proof rules as conjunction into it, then we can show, uh, I showed it here for the sequence calculus, um, that we can uh, get from, that we can get this interdrivability between these uh, two um, um, yeah, formulas containing these different uh, conjunctions. Um, because yeah, they are defined by the same uh, set of rules, it's uh, no problem basically. 
Likewise, we can show if we now take conjunction double prime to be defined by the same dual proof rules, so only the dual proof rules as conjunction, we can show now that uh, we can get this interderivability with respect to this dual probability relation. Yeah, again, it's yeah, problem. Um, but the thing is, there's no possibility to determine by this characterization that there's then only one connective of, con of, of conjunction. Because, of course, we do not get the f these following sequence. So we cannot get from, yes, we cannot um, get from the, uh, so the conjunction double prime is characterized by the dual proof rules, right? So we cannot get this for the, for the positive uh, um, inferential relation. And we cannot get this for conjunction prime of its con um, defined by the proof rules for the negative uh, consequence relation. So the question would be, can we then know that there's only one conjunction with a unique meaning? Um, since there's no interdrivability possible, might it be the case that we have to say that there's a conjunction <coughs> for proving and a conjunction for refuting? And this is something that we wouldn't want, right? Because we want to say, conjunction has one meaning and not if we prove that it has a different meaning than if we refute. This, is, um, this would be bad. However, way out um, is if we take a look at our rules again. Um, so the dual proof rules for implication or the proof rules for co-implication. Then we see that here we have um, a mixture of the consequence relations within uh, one rule. So here we have double lines and single lines. In sequel calculus, this is uh, expressed by this mixture of plus and minus. Or in the left rules of a mixture of, um, so we get something from the assumptions and from the counter assumptions, uh, <coughs> into the counter assumptions, or here into the assumptions. So, what we can see here is that the consequence relations are actually intertwined in the characterization of the connectives. Mm. So the rules for implication and for co-implication, they need both interoperability relations in, um, in a single rule, so the normal and the dual one. So that would mean then, okay, it is not correct to think in general of the proof rules as generating the consequence relation and the dual proof rules to generate the dual consequence relation. But actually, um, yeah, they work together. We are, um, they must be, um, they, they are intertwined in the, in the characterization of the uh, connectors. And so we are not allowed to use these different duplications of a connective if we want to show its uniqueness. So we are not allowed to show like, it just for the proof rules and for the dual proof rules. Um, but when we dupli duplicate <coughs> this connective, we need to use the same duplications uh, for both proof rules and for the dual proof rules. And this way, it is ensured that we're not talking about different connectors in different contexts of proving or refuting. So what I um, would then is my suggestion to modify uniqueness criterion in a bilateral setting is to just mm, basically just modify it uh, and say it has to be um, shown that there are uh, not only interdrivability that they are usually interderivable, but they are, that they are also dually interderivable, which means in this context just interderivable with respect to this um, uh, yeah, dual derivability um, uh, relation. So formally expressed for the uh, case of two and mm, we can just say that this must be the case, this interoperability with respect to the plus relation and also uh, with respect to the minus uh, relation. And if this is the case, um, then we have uniqueness secured. The advantage of this um, modified uh, definition is that uh, because <coughs> 2 int is just like n4, it is also non-congruential. 
So we would also get the same problem here, basically. So not all, all formulas which are equivalent with respect to our usual uh, relation are also equivalent with respect to this dual interoperability um, relation. Uh, an example would be here. Yeah, these formulas which is basically um, an equivalent example to one in and four, which is differently written down. Mm. But if we have now equivalence of formulas both with respect to um, the one and uh, the dual uh, consequence relation, then we also have synonymy guaranteed. And this yeah, is proven by uh, one thing in, the, uh, in this paper. So if we have uh, interoperability of both consequence relations, then we immediately get synonymy. So with this de definition that I just gave, not only uniqueness to within equivalence is guaranteed, but also uniqueness to within synonymy, and that's what we want in a non-concurrential system. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, yeah, now, that was, I think, three steps of my plan. So that was the modified uh, definition of uniqueness. Now I'm going to this part <coughs> where I want to say something about, okay, could this um, lead us towards going for this or for that kind of uh, proof system? What I want to um, compare first, I told you in the beginning about these different kinds of bilateralism and that Rumford, for example, has, these, uh, has a, a system with side formulas. Now, I... <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and we have these same consequence relations. In rapid system, it's always I'm always a bit struggling. I must be honest, uh, but maybe people here have a way better um, understanding of this. But there's a bit of an unclear status, which also I mean I'm not the only one who thinks that, but it has been criticized with some uh, people. This unclear status of what is exactly this plus and minus. Um, these would be the rules that Rumford gives. So basically, this means um, we assert A and we assert B, then we can assert A and B. Um, and the way he motivates it is that you can give a plus if you would answer yes <coughs> to. So you ask A, and then you say yes. If you ask B, you say yes. Then you can also say yes to A and B. Uh, and no for the minuses. Mm, but, okay, the plus and the minus, it can't be really part of the formula because, um, like, like connectives are, for example, part of complex formulas, because it, uh, it's not possible to iterate the plus and minuses. Mm, because it's also not possible to um, yeah, iterate or embed a speech act, so yes, it makes sense that you are not allowed to do this, but um, Okay, it's not part of the formulas. Instead, it must always act on premises or conclusions of rules, and thereby a speech act is formed. If I get it correctly, I mean, if you ask yourself, okay, where can I put this plus or minus, then it must always be when you are allowed to put it in front of premises or <coughs> conclusions of these rules, and thereby you don't formulas but then you have speech acts. Mm. But on the other hand, rules uh, in this system, how would you define a rule? You would have to define it in some way that it acts not on formulas but it acts on speech acts as premises and as conclusions. And this, for me, it sounds a bit circular. But this is, um, this is not my strongest argument here because I'm really not sure if I'm just not understanding it correctly, um, but that is always something that bothers me a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, another point that has been made by um, Restor and by uh, Kürbis is also about the unclear status of plus and minus. Um, making and discharging assumptions is still part of the system, and you can say that making an, assu an assumption or discharging an assumption is itself also a speech act. But speech acts cannot be embedded, as we just 
said, and Ed Rumford also said. So what exactly would it mean to write something like this? Because this, oh, yeah, is something like could be making um, an assertion of A or discharging an assertion of A. Okay, so there we would have to say that speech acts are embedded, maybe. Mm -hmm. And the problem with defining uniqueness, I think, is now um, part of this. It's not part of the formula. So um, if we, you really want to give a um, precise formal definition of uniqueness, we would have to demand something like interrivably of formulas with copycat connectors with otherwise same components. But the plus and minus are not part, uh, they're not components of the formulas. So I have problems to see how we could really give a precise and formal definition of uniqueness in such a system if we cannot form copycat, um, copycat formula, um, formulas with the otherwise same components. So this would be something, yeah, for me to say, hmm, this, this, the, 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 the sign consequence relations are um, better than the sign formulas. Um, another thing now is to say, okay, uh, I'm still talking about um, what might be a better or worse representation of a proof system. There are different ways to represent a proof system. And um, as I told you before, there's this, um, the usual unilateral version of N4 has impure rules. But there's also a bilateral sequence calculus for N4, given in a paper by Norino Camille and, and Wanzin, where they call it um, SN4, SN4 for a subformula calculus. Yeah, like that. Mm. And there we have a bilateral consequence relation um, where we have sequence with two sided assumptions and conclusions of this form. So this would basically then stand for um, what I had as um, turn step plus and this here. So there you, you have two sided um, conclusions too. Um, you can do it, I mean I uh, there Heinrich did that and now we talked about it and now we're both thinking that um, this is a better way than this because this basically just hides a bit the fact that you have different inter uh, uh, different derivability relations, but it's basically um, and just another form to write it down. And uh, the relation to G and four G and four is the usual uh, calculus given for N four is that uh, in G and four you need um, oh, so you have. Uh, these zero premise rules and these. So for the, the so mm -hmm. usual one and the same you need it for strong negation. Um, so a unilateral proof system a la Brabitz in natural reduction would look like this. So here you see we have impure rules mm, because yeah, yeah, here I chose the one for uh, implication uh, two. So for strongly negated implication and so on, and uh, in a bilateralist proof system, in the sequence, um, in the subformula calculus, uh, it looks like this. And as you can see, I mean, you don't have to see the details or whatever, but you can basically see that <coughs> the negation doesn't occur here. So the thing is now in. Like I said before, in a unilateral calculus for N4, to get uniqueness to within synonymy, we would need to use um, strong negation in our definition for, uh, for secure and synonymy. Um, but this uh, strong negation is only definable in terms of other connectives. So, like I said before, this is circular. Whereas in the bilateral calculus, we could easily uh, manage to give a definition of uniqueness like the way I did be before for um, SC2 and we could uh, easily transfer this to this um, calculus and thereby get uniqueness to the synonymy without any circular conditions. So I think this um, here 
this would be a point for me where you could say that if you want uniqueness and there are reasons to want uniqueness, then there might be a better presentation for um, a proof system where you get uniqueness, whereas otherwise, if you formulate it like this, then uh, yeah, you don't get it. And yeah, just <coughs> very like, I don't know, only two slides. This was something um, that, yeah. Heinrich Wanzing and I, um, it's not a work in progress anymore because we handed in the manuscript now two weeks ago or something like this, but it's still uh, very new. But uh, yeah, we thought about uh, extensions to um, multilateralism. There is something like this around in the literature, not a lot, um, and coming from a very different realm, I would say. Mm, so from not that much proof theoretic, but more of it, um, I would say more of it, more theoretic. Um, but still, if you consider something like, okay, we want these, pro uh, we want these speech acts uh, to be on a par, then some people argue, okay, but they are not only speech acts of assertion and denial, but we could also consider something like um, being indifferent or being in doubt about something. Um, so, like, um, so at least different, um, I would call these rather different attitudes than speech acts, but um, okay, like I said, we are not really about uh, speech acts at all. Mm. So, but there might be reasons where you would want to say, okay, you could even go for more than bilateralism, but for multilateralism. And um, yeah, for this, we um, expanded in four by two human reconnectors, M and M. M A reads that it is meaningful that A and N A it is nonsensical that A. And in the fashion of this uh, subformula calculus and form, we devised a tetralateral sequence calculus S N four M N with four different sequence signs. So just like um, just like turns by minus. So, supposed to capture preservation of falsity um, instead of having to incorporate these impure rules with negation, which you would otherwise have to do. Here you can say, okay, um, this uh, turns to M and turns to M capture preservation of meaningfulness uh, or respectively nonsensicality from premises to conclusion. And yeah. The motivation to go for these different sequence sites then is that just like strong negation, these connectives are also congruentiality breaking. So if you have them in their language, then you do not have this integrability of all compound formulas with respect to your usual consequence relation. Mm. So if you don't have this, then you cannot say that the rules of your proof system are um, meaning giving, so they cannot uh, at the same time <coughs> want to make a point of proof theoretic semantics. However, if we then use these multiple sequence signs, this allows us then to define congruentiality um, just as a purely structural property, so without any appeal to any um, connectives at all, and thereby you can avoid then uh, the characterization of the connectives uniqueness in terms of the other connectives. So in the same fashion as I proposed this for um, bilateral settings, you can secure uniqueness in such a multilateral setting if you just um, demand integrability with respect to then all the consequence relations that are present in the system. And yes, this can get a bit messy. Um, I mean, that's why I didn't, I showed you only these slides and not all the rules or something for this uh, for this calculus because, of course, you saw in this um, other calculus you need double the amount. Now for tetralateral you can imagine how many rules you need. Um, but there might be reasons to yeah, to say that uh, something like this, something like multilateralism, 
might be philosophically uh, interesting and then maybe you have put, to put up with these proof systems. Okay, in conclusion, from point of view of proof theoretic semantics, uniqueness is definitely a feature that is desirable. And as I showed you in the beginning, there are several features in logical systems, like representation and non-congruentiality and so on, that may cause problems for unique characterization of connectors. And in a bilateral setting, with two consequence relation, one for provability, one for dual probability, um, interoperability, uh, um, we must demand interoperability with, with respect to uh, both consequence relations. The thing though is, okay, these multiple consequence relations, these were in the beginning also what actually caused the problem for uniqueness. So in, in, in the beginning you have these two sets of rules and dual proof rules and two consequence relations and that's why uh, uniqueness seems to get messed up. But the thing is, Yes, this causes the problem, but so do many other features in other <coughs> logical systems. What I want to emphasize is that they cause the problem, but on the other hand, they also offer a very nice and elegant solution to just um, modify your uniqueness criteria and to secure, uh, secure your uniqueness in your system. Uh, that was it. <laughs>
I know I uh, discussed this with also uh, with different people, maybe also with you, Peter, in Berlin. But um, yeah, so several people have pointed this out. It, okay. Like, because absolutely, in one way you could say, okay, you can easily transfer it into the system, just like you said. Um, but I would say, um, so for me, two things are, so on the one hand, it's um, if you want to stress that it's, um, so on one hand, it's maybe really this conceptual thing that you want to stress that it's about the um, derivability relations rather than something that happens just on the level of the formulas, but there it always must be something that happens between the formulas. So I don't know if it's. Um, um, I mean, uh, on this uh, on this account, it wouldn't make um, you couldn't have just a plus a, right? On, on my account now, because there's always this relation between different. Um, um, so this would be one thing, and, and to stress this, I think it makes more sense to um, then sign the consequences. Um, secondly, about this uh, about this unclear status, um, which I criticized in Rumpet's uh, system, I'm really always yeah I'm always a bit puzzled about this that you can uh, you can only have plus a, but a cannot stand again for plus or minus a and so on and, but, and also this making the starting of assumptions I found this criticism quite convincing um, and then thirdly about this uh, uniqueness definition that it's about derivability and then it makes it way easier to have different derivability relations to give a definition of uniqueness than to have these um, differently signed formulas and uh, yeah, come up with this and incorporate the connectives within this. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm not sure how to give a precise definition then for uniqueness in the signed formula system. But I I might be I might be wrong about this. <laughs> but uh, about the uh, the first thing I think that is. Yeah. Is a question related to this? Because I, I have kind of everything is related, but no, <laughs> it's <such a> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so regarding this issue of um, of defining uniqueness, mm -hmm. so something that so it turns out that I read like a famous paper last week several times a day because I'm working on I'm working on this famous paper. Oh, mm -hmm. So it's very fresh in my memory. Mm -hmm. And so the way he, so actually the, the criteria he gives is not exactly the same that he gives. So it's not an interderivability, I mean interderivability, it's, it's just a special case. What he has is two conditions, so that uh, for example, he has Planck and Planck. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a sequence with Planck as a premise, you should have exactly, you should be able to derive the same sequence with Planck instead mm -hmm. as a premise, and similarly in the conclusion. So of course the hard part is to prove the, 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 the identity because mm -hmm. you have Plink and there's Plink and you need to prove that Plink and there's Plonk and that's what is hard to do. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the general definition of the criterion is, more, is a bit more general. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had this from Humberstone, not from... Um, yeah, uh, okay. and I think that's things that since... Gen Okay, it's, it's a side issue, but the, the, the systems dependency is also already present in the last paper. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, but um, but I think so. If you have this more general definition in mind, mm -hmm. um, I don't see why there will there will be a limitation. Uh, uh, you just want that, for example, if you have a plus a plus b plus in premise position, in the sequence, you need to derive exactly the same sequence except if you replace it with a link uh, b plus. Similarly, with if it's there's minus, and the same in the in the consequence position. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's so. And if you secure that, you will have uniqueness. 
So would that be a solution to the to the difficulty that you're I don't know. I mean, I'm just like thinking out loud, but uh, um, it's not just a matter of interoperability. I'm I'm not really sure. So what what is the more general? Um, Can I use a blackboard? I don't know if we have a pen. I don't think I don't have. <laughs> oh, she puts them in this box. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, do, do you mean that? I mean, he talks about, mm -hmm, and then he says, and basically this comes down to showing the interoperability, right? Because he assumes, of course, some structural yes. properties of the. Yes. But uh, I think the interoperability is just a special case of the of the uniqueness condition. It's just. Uh, I guess in most in in the, in, this, in the context of the disability is interested in it's equivalent, mm -hmm. but not in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to if you have like a logic which is uh, not reflexive, I mean, why not? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's so, that's right. yeah. So, um, so what is so what is key to the criterion is the fact that whenever you have the formula in one at one place in a given sequence and you replace it with this copycat. Uh, you preserve the reliability of the sequence, and and so if you have only one notion of derivability, but several signs to put into formulas, mm -hmm. uh, you would just need to secure the fact that uh, a signed formula where you replace only the and you substitute it with the copycat is all. Uh, so if it's hard to explain in words, mm -hmm. but if you have a sequence and and among the um, the primitive, you have a sign formula with a primitive, and then you take exactly the same sequence with, with, with the same with the formula, the same sign, and just replace going to the copycat. I guess it should also mm. be derivable. And you do that with all, all positions and with all signs. Mm. Uh, it seems like this will uh, give you a method to define like this this definition of uniqueness will not have the drawbacks of pure interoperability in the context of the, the sign formula calculi. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm also I'm not really sure about this um, thing. It just seemed to me, I mean, I tried to work out a precise uh, definition for this and it just seemed to me problematic that then do it for for example for any com compound formulas because of this thing that the plus and the minus is never a part of it but then you have to somehow construct compound formulas where this connective is still in but the plus and the minus then doesn't uh, really apply to the formula where the connective is in you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Mm. Can you? Okay. Yeah? Uh, I cannot explain. So it's yeah. not really important that I do. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it seemed to me a bit uh, okay. problematic to have these uh, copycat, uh, to do this copycat thing mm -hmm. um, with respect to then compound formulas um, where the connective in question is just embedded and the plus and the minus is not uh, is not applying to this connective, right? Because it's all, it only can apply to the outmost formula, basically. Yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. And this seemed to me then a bit um, problematic. If, if I get it right, yeah, yeah. it's like... Um, if you have the plus and minus, but it's, I mean, I may completely misunderstand it, eh? but just to check whether. Mm -hmm. um, so, you have the plus and minus, they kind of form proof theoretically um, together with the connective. You're introducing a, s a, a specific connective, uh, like uh, plonk plus and plonk minus, mm -hmm. you could say. And this one connective, the, the, the one that is signed, so to say, cannot be inside a formula. Uh, so inside the formula, there's a pure plonk or pure mm -hmm. or another connective. 
and not the signed one on the inside, while proof theoretically you're always dealing with the signed ones on the when you introduce them. You don't introduce Plonk, but you introduce Plonk plus or Plonk minus, uh, and on the inside the formula, you don't have Plonk plus or Plonk minus, you just have Plonk. And that's, I don't know whether that's the, the idea yeah. you're expressing. But I think, I mean, it's also, it's just more a problem um, in my head, more than an idea, but somehow I... Mm, so that as problematic when you really want to give a very general um, definition capturing all these cases. Um, but yeah. Thanks for the anything more about it. That's the definitely helpful. We have two more questions. Uh, I don't know if it was a follow-up or a question. But no, it's a, it's a, it is our first ever question coming in on YouTube from Jordan. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> who says? Who says? Thank you for the great talk. And also, just wanted to ask a, uh, a clarificatory question. So, why is it that you see the uh, uh, impure rules as undesirable? Um, I mean, okay, this is um, this is of course only if you um, if you assume something like proof theoretic semantics, and you say uh, that the meaning of the connectives is uh, given, is characterized by uh, the rules of inference that we have. And then you have uh, impure rules where not only this connective occurs, but some other uh, connective occurs. Then the characterization in some way hinges on this other connective. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but if you... Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, this seems undesirable uh, that you want to um, give the meaning of connectives in terms of rules, but there are also other connectives, and the meaning of these connectives, I mean, must also be given in some way of, um, yeah, by their rules. Um, I mean, this is gen in general, I would say, in seen in proof theoretic semantics as undesirable to have, um, yeah, in, in some way you want to have these uh, yeah, pure definitions of the connectives and not in terms of other connectors because it might get into yeah some kind of holism which people don't want <laughs> or <laughs> not not everyone wants yeah I hope this I'll answers. see if there's a follow up but thanks <laughs> <laughs> okay Peter yeah uh, thanks a lot for this great talk uh, which was very helpful uh, for me um, so I want to ask first, I have other questions, but a very general question uh, about the whole concept of uniqueness and it's kind of related to, to the S question. Um, so I've always been puzzled, and this is nothing specific to your talk, uh, but uh, by this interderivability concept as, as a way to formalize uh, uh, uniqueness. I mean, this is almost like insane. <laughs> um, because, you know, um, the, the, the informal way to express it is like having the same role, uh, roles, uh, uh, the, the, the copycat and the other, the, 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 the original connectives should have the same role, play the same roles in both premise and conclusion. Mm -hmm. But um, this doesn't mean that they are actually interderivable uh, um, for me because, um, I mean, they are. Uh, how can I say this? Yeah, uh, it's of course an important part of my question. Um, like Interderivability says something about the relation between the two, how they work together. Uh, while that's not the uh, issue, uh, their role inside the system um, should be the same, uh, but this has It says nothing about how they work together, um, uh, and certainly not uh, on, on on different sides of the of the of the turnstile. Um, so, if you have interdeniability, one is on the one side of the turnstile and the other on the on the other sides, uh, 
and they may only do work on one side and they do the same work on, on that one side. Um, if you have only the introduction rules for, for disjunction, for example, uh, that's going to be, of course, uh, not, as you mentioned, not a unique uh, connective you introduce. But on the other hand, it, it, correct, it, it, it uniquely defines the role it plays, namely only as a connective that, is, uh, that, that, that functions on the left side of the terminal. You haven't given anything about how it performs on the right side. Uh, so it doesn't perform at all. You can never conclude it. You can just eliminate it. Um, but uniquely, uh, you have given the rules for elimination. Um, it's not that there is some freedom allowed on the right-hand side, because there is nothing you can do on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's unfair, kind of, to, 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 to require for a uniqueness something about stuff happening on the right side if you, even for connectives that have no rules, where you have said nothing about what you do on the right side. Uh, so if you think of premise, behavior of premise usage uh, as something that is fundamentally different from an inferentialist point of view than uh, 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 conclusion behavior, um, that it's for me, but this is probably a very specific way uh, to, to, to look at logic um, uh, that, that I like, um, that it is really weird to express uniqueness uh, uh, in terms of something that requires usage as a premise and as a conclusion uh, for always, for any connective, even if you don't have any rules for uh, conclusion use. Mm -hmm. So that bothers yeah. me a bit. Uh, it seems like if you only... Like it should be separated, uh, the premise use and the conclusion use, if you're talking about uniqueness. I should have said yeah. like the premise. Sorry, I'm. I'm, I'm mm. uh, I just uh, add one little thing. Um, if you have a premise, um, like it seems to me that if you just have the introduction for disjunction rules, um, you. Uh, you have uniquely. Defines uh, its left hand is, is premise usage, um, and you have said nothing at all about it, its uh, its 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 conclusion usage. But there is no conclusion usage, so that's not a problem, sort of. Uh, but I know my my question is not very precise. But I don't know how do you get this intuition. Uh, that you cannot just combine them into a sort of interdirectability where... Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so at the beginning of your question, um, I was more with you, I think, because um, I also remember when I read about it for the first time, and also in, in between, again and again, it looked like, okay, but um, is that really what not? All the thing, things you said, I don't have to um, <laughs> repeat them. Uh, but now, when you come to something like, like in the end, I would, I would disagree to say that if I understood you correctly, that there can be a difference in premise usage and in conclusion usage, um, because this sounds a bit like what I said in the talk about we don't want that conjunction has a different meaning in proofs versus in refutation. We also don't want that conjunction has a different meaning when we use it in premises versus when we, when we use it in the conclusion, right? I mean, this seems, at least to me, very, very not what, what we would want, because th there is one meaning and you can use it as a premise, you can use it as a conclusion. The meaning doesn't change. And the other thing would be, it would be weird to have a connective that can only be used in one or the other. Why? I mean, um, I don't know. You might have. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't. I mean, we're yeah, talking at I a very abstract level yeah. to logic. Um, so, 
of course, um, you have to specify both sides. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say that, uh, well, these are the introduction rules and now I have a, a, a connective that is simply uniquely defined. You should say, uh, these are the uh, introduction rules and for example, there are no uh, um, elimination rules, which is also a specification of the elimination rules, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, for me, uniquely uh, defines a connective, uh, uh, or, well, there might be other criteria for it, but if you have specified the rules exactly for premise and for conclusion, uh, I don't see, like, uh, from a sort of very general perspective, why you should dismiss all logics where this doesn't completely uh, correspond to the, the, the premise use and the, the, pre the conclusion use. Like, if you have uh, got three systems or something, then um, they can go apart, uh, premise mm -hmm. use and conclusion use. Uh, I mean, uh, non-transitive systems, I mean, mm -hmm. not where, where, where gut is not even admissible. Um, or non-reflexive systems or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you, by such definition of uniqueness, you sort of uh, immediately exclude all these sort of approaches um, to logic, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. It fits well in a framework where you have uh, these structural rules uh, for free. Uh, maybe not uh, broader than that. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also not, definitely not in general against substructural approach or something like that, but I still, like, philosophically, I would get Belknap's argument to say they should behave in the same way in, so, in premises and uh, in the conclusion. So philosophically, I must say, this makes sense to me. Okay, so and then... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very familiar, for example, with non-reflexive systems, yeah. so I don't know how convincing I would find them, but um, I know that there are some, but I don't really know who they are. Um, I would personally say, like, in the premise, the, the, the original one should uh, ha um, work in exactly the same way in premises, should have the same role in premises, uh, as the copy, and in conclusions also it should have the same role as the, and the same for conclusions, in conclusions it should have this exactly the same role as the other one has in conclusions, but not the one in premises should have the same role as the one, in, as the other, as a copy in conclusions, that seems to be comparing uh, apples and pears, if that's an expression in English. Yeah, but, uh, but that is also not what he says. Does well, if, if you have interdirivability, you derive a premise from a conclusion. So it's a premise use, you, com you compare it to conclusion use. You plonk is on the left side and plink is on yeah, the right side. Yeah, but to derive side. it is not uh, to say that they are then playing the same role. Mm. You, you can derive one from the other, yes. Because the they should both play the same role, both in the premises the same and both in the conclusion the same. Yes, but that doesn't mean that the premise should be the same as the conclusion. The premise of premise of plane should be sort of give you the conclusion of, of Plonk. Uh, because you, you know, derivability is always from premise to conclusion, right? So mm -hmm. the, you, you take the original one on the left and the the copycats on the right. If but you have interdirivability. If, if you say they have to have the same in premises and the same in conclusion, then it comes down to. Well, in structural systems. Uh, but as soon yeah, as yeah. you. Okay. Mm, yeah. mm. Seems that you. But maybe there's literature on this. Maybe I too substructurally <laughs> focused to. To, to Probably in Humberstone. But of course, the logics you talk about are all structural, so in that sense, it's not a very. Uh, yeah, I mean, deep of course. Criticism or something. Uh, no, no, but I. I, I still get the criticism. Yeah. Yeah. There's a follow up. It's, it's actually not a follow up, to, it's, just, it's just me. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, those are those misses, thanks. Uh, okay. And he said that he can't be here to discuss more. Um, I, I think I'm asking a kind of similar question, but I'm asking it as a philosopher of biology who used to know a lot of logic 15 years ago when I was an undergraduate. Um, so maybe I maybe this is maybe I am I am too sort of class. I, I certainly haven't ever worked in logics as bizarre as these. So perhaps I'm just too classically classical logic focused. But one thing that would help me is so when you say um, uniqueness is about only having one the maximum of one connective that plays the same kind of role in proofs. Uh, and then you say, so imagine what would happen if you had two connectives that obeyed the same rules. How should I understand the concept of a role that doesn't involve talking about the introduction and elimination rules? Because that's where I'm, I'm immediately like, wait, but like, but you just told me the rule, like the rules are the same, so that's what it does. So if the rules are what it does, then it's the same connective. So uh, what, 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 what is there to, what does role start to mean? How could, how could role, how does role come apart from the introduction and elimination rules? I, I guess this is also yeah, very related to a uh, just question. So um, the thing is, I mean, you assume now that we have introduction and elimination rules, which we have in our like normal and well-behaved systems and so on. And um, I think the problems, I mean, they would definitely start um, like when you just have only an introduction rule only an elimination rule, which is exactly what, uh, what was the case with Planck, right? So they only had a uh, right, uh, if you want to go for a sequence calculus now, then you had only a right introduction rule and no left one. So nothing that tells you at all how this formula behaves on the left side of the sequence uh, sign. So... Well, I, no, I don't agree with that. I think uh, it does tell you something about it, namely that it does, it should never cannot do anything. <laughs> That's just as informative yeah, okay. as yeah. saying this is what you can do with it, you can do nothing with it. It's it's there is it's, it's a very nice uh, characterization of a collective. <laughs> yeah, I guess I mean that's that was uh, there's a sense in which that, that was my that was my intuition as well. It, when when confronted with the Plonk and Plink example, my initial response was just, well if you tell me that the only thing I can do with Plonk is I can go from B to A Plonk B. And the only thing I can do with Plink is I can go from B to A Plink B. I'm, my, my gut reaction is just, about the same connective, cool. Yeah, I mean, right? that's, okay, this is, uh, maybe I um, didn't emphasize this enough that uh, what Bernard's actual um, argumentation is, or maybe you can, it's maybe it's fresher in your memory, but he explicitly says, um, and also the, the Tonk issue he, he solves on the background of saying, well, we have these um, assumptions about uh, derivability, namely that it's uh, transitive and uh, or we can do permutation and, um, and so on and so on. So basically the usual structural Gensen rules are assumed. Cool. And then um, against this background, you cannot do this which you should be able to do. So against this background, it makes sense. But as Peter said, you, of course, nowadays, uh, we are very much like, well, you don't have to assume that uh, the consequence relation is transitive and so on. Um, this will, of course, then um, create a problem. So this is probably a beer question. I need, you to, I need you to talk me through an example of a logic weird enough that this stuff starts to fail. Because I think it's my, like, I've never worked with one. So like my brain is unable to see how you could start to drive a wedge between these notions. So I need you to tell me, well, we, we, yeah, over the beer, we, you can tell me about a really bizarre logic. <laughs> then I'll start to get where you're coming from. It's not bizarre. That's <laughs> <laughs> what so think of Browning is a reflexive. Sorry? Browning is a reflexive. Sure. Sure. Okay, I want to hear more about this later too. <laughs> oh, uh, let's, let's, uh, if, if you understand rounding, then you, you want to treat it as a, as a consequence, a sort of consequence, a very constrained consequence relation, then you don't want to replace it. And according to me, relevance is neither reflexive nor transitive. Uh, so okay, yeah, this right. reflexive is not monotone anymore. Uh, mm. Mm. Okay. So, but okay. that's uh, more controversial.
Um, I have my own question, so I don't know if there are more, but just raise your hand. So uh, I'm trying to connect this notion of, of sequence that you give, slide 11, so it's at the beginning of the presentation, uh, and trying to connect them with other readings that I'm more familiar with by mm -hmm. other religion. And a first, a first question that I have for you is um, how this, I don't know if, if you have an answer or no, it's, it's very general, how this would uh, be applied, if possible, um, in a non-intuitionistic setting, so with multiple conclusions, for instance. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let's think about this. Um, so, yeah. I mean, what was my remembering was from the assumption and the counter assumptions. Then, if we have multiple, I'm really I mean, yeah, no, mm -hmm. I'm so this first question and mm -hmm. I, as as I said, is very general. Um, is related to so when I was trying to see what your definition here of sequence connecting to more simple ones, for instance, we get restos, you cannot accept the premises and reject the conclusion at the same time. My question was, is maybe this setting in which we have in the premises of the, of the inference gammas and deltas accepted and rejected, and then we, with this acceptance and rejection, we either accept or reject some conclusion C, whether uh, if we accepted multiple conclusions, we couldn't have this complicated system, because we could already move the deltas into the, where the C is. Mm -hmm. So we... Uh, we would have for free something like simple, you cannot accept uh, gamma and reject delta at the same time, in which in delta you have more than one point. Okay, so wait, so you say if we have this uh, and we read this in, so from the assumptions now, yeah? Yeah, we that start. Gamma and delta are the assumptions and counter assumptions? Yes, we have gamma and delta, mm -hmm. uh, which we accept gamma and reject delta, and this leads us to accept C, for instance. Ah, okay. If yeah, we have multiple that's conclusions, why, yeah. we could move the delta maybe and say, and then have a Restalian uh, reading, more bilateral, in which we would say, we cannot accept delta, uh, gamma and reject at the same time delta and C. Yeah. With, but I, I'm not, I, this is something, this is a... Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I was thinking if I... I think right now I have seen something like this by Greg, no? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, which, which looked a bit like, but I, I cannot really remember how exactly you were supposed to read, so I'm not really sure, but that yes, you can maybe, that someone else seen this talk? No, okay. Um, <laughs> 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 who? Sorry, who? who? By, by Greg? Uh, ah, Greg. So, um, okay. okay. It was at the last year's AAL, um, they gave a talk which was also related to bilateralism and it was about also having assumptions and counter assumptions. Um, okay, I can check that. But, uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I don't really know how yeah. it wor would work because, because I never work in classical systems basically, so I'm... Um, Okay, then yeah. that was the question. If if mm. there is something like, I don't know, if you had like a, an idea of how this would apply in the in the classical, but yeah, it's okay. Yeah, but, okay. Like something. But, but is it something you can just do? So put your assumptions then just in the conclusion because I mean that yeah, because it still strikes me as something you assume, you take it to be true, you take it to be false, and from this you draw something? Isn't it something different than... But yeah, in my yeah, so in my conclusions you would have to say, okay, and then you draw either verification of this or okay. falsification? There's a version of that talk on Greg's YouTube channel. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> from last, like last March, last May, something okay. like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure right now. Yeah, I think that's it. I think I would want to this. Um. Um, yeah, uh, so I wanted, so, so this was, uh, my, my last question was very general and sort of mm -hmm. more critical. But um, 
same time, I'm very attracted to 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 this the, the uniqueness thing uh, uh, combined with bilateralism and, and the thing you proposed. Um, and, and to me, it seems like an argument uh, in favor of uh, or an argument to, to, to convince a unilateralist that you have to go bilateralism, or you don't um, you don't define connectives basically uh, in the right way. You don't give the full uh, meaning of the connective if you don't also have the bilateral characterization. Um, like it seems that a conjunction that a unilateralist gives with this proof system is just lacking. It's it's, it's ambiguous. Uh, it can both uh, you just give the proof rules for it and not the anti-proof uh, uh, rules. Uh, and so you say how you deal with verification, but you don't say how you deal with falsification of it. And uh, uh, this is an act we engage in uh, in falsifying. And uh, I mean. It seems that other states uh, in the world, they, they can falsify formulas or the worlds can falsify or whatever. Um, it's not something that people find philosophically problematic or something. Uh, so it seems that a unilateralist should uh, either like uh, in the background uh, uh, tell an implicit story about how to deal with, with the anti-proof rules uh, like implicitly uh, that you can calculate them from the proof rules. Mm. But if that is not present, then what she has defined, or uh, a unilateralist, is simply an ambiguous uh, connective, uh, uh, not a full characterization of, of conjunction, for example. Mm. What, what would you think of such uh, an argument? I mean, I, I personally like it, of course. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Well, no, I, I was just thinking if. Um, because I was thinking of something that uh, Pravitz uh, wrote, and he is like very just verificationist, I think. Um, I don't know if you ever changed his mind about this, but what I um, read was that, okay, he very much defends this uh, only verifications. And I was just wondering if somebody who is for certain philosophical reasons, I'm I don't really know, um, but who would be very convinced of that, um, whether they would accept that they have to think about falsificationism at all. Because actually what I, um, what I showed you with the uh, dual rules for implication, that was for Pravitz a reason against falsificationism, basically that you have these two different, that you have you have to give a proof of A and a refutation of B, and this gives you a refutation of A and plus B. That was for him this, what I said, uh, the, these consequence relation and the or something like that. That was for him saying this shouldn't be the case. Maybe then you could say why why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, um, press him maybe on this. But this shouldn't be the case. Um, and um, that's why we shouldn't, yeah, um, consider falsificationism at all. And I mean, okay. And uh, Van Zing's argument against this was, well, this is just because we just consider this implication. If we would just as naturally consider co-implication, then you could say the same about the verification rules for co-implication, basically. But of course, you can't say you just consider co-implication if you take falsification seriously and so on. So a bit, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I think that's the way out. Saying, well, there's only verification. We should never talk about falsification. It's a, it's a, it's an ill-conceived concept. Uh, and mm. so that's, I guess, naively, I would say that's the way out. That's, mm. But if you think you take the falsification seriously, um, then. Yeah. Then, and you're not specifying, um, uh, you only give the usual rules for conjunction, for example, then you didn't give rules for conjunction, you didn't define a connective uniquely, yeah. uh, you defined, well, something that is ambiguous. Yeah, and I mean, I think there are, I would also say, like, just philosophically, there are reasons to press the people who are just considering very like verification rules or some or proof like 
you could say, okay, why? Um, this, is there something like the same uh, things that were said about assertion and denial? Um, basically saying that um, denial is just as yeah, not reductive, uh, non reductive as assertion, I think. There are reasons for that. So, yes. And then you can say you have to go to <laughs> That's good. Uh, just a quick follow-up and then a question. I think you have to be careful because it depends what you put under, like, uh, what the basic commitments of bilateralism is. I mean, if the basic commitments of bilateralism is, is ha having, like, denial as being primitive, but then the kind of argument you give sounds a bit like begging the question. Because you say, hey, you have very poor falsification, should be taken seriously as, if you mean as being primitive, then you put in the premise kind of, I mean, philosophically at least. So that's why I think this kind of, I would be like, a lot hinges on the details, how you, yeah, which true. premise you take. But that's just a basic remark. The, the, the question I wanted to ask you is about multilateralism. So of course this is like a very interesting generalization. Uh, so I, 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 I'm curious to read the paper and the why and the, like your, examples with meaning and nonsense, I think this is quite interesting. But I was thinking of perhaps even like simpler ways to do multilateralism mm -hmm. uh, by considering many value logics, for example. Like, like the different attitudes you have, so it's not like denial and, and rejection, but one attitude corresponding to whatever true values you have in your logic. Mm -hmm. And another example that seems like uh, interesting and it's related to the discussion you had uh, Earlier, actually, over lunch, about uh, like uh, the attitude you can have towards like uh, uh, belief in God. I mean, if you if, if you if you play the the square game and you and you distinguish those four attitudes, like I uh, I believe God does not exist. I I mean, there are four possibilities. Yeah. I mean, this this could be perhaps another example. I mean, I was just so my question is, why did you choose this particular uh, example and? How far do you think this uh, multilateralism could be applied? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just a question for you then. Um, so, because I mean, when I am talking about bilateralism or multilateralism or something like this, always in the context of proof theory semantics. Okay. Um, which I mean, which is kind of justified because the origins of bilateralism were hmm. proof theory semantics, right? If you now say, okay, you have different truth values, like how does it? Um, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, it looks I like mean, a, yeah, we'll start with the semantical characterization of. Uh, um, no, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, but okay, here's here's one thing. So, for example, think about MT. Uh, MT. Uh, has you can do a, a sequence calculus like you have a three sequence calculus for FD, but it's impure. Mm -hmm. You have to have rules and obligations, and this is like from the from the standpoint of pure, uh, pure theoretical semantics, it's bad. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, uh, but of course they have like uh, many valued matrices for FD, mm -hmm. in which you don't have this problem because if you have more space, if you can take more attitudes to propositions. Mm -hmm. You can uh, decide to take to take them as true or to take them as only true or only false or both. So I mean, you know all the like the four values. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can say uh, you can give uh, rules if you have, if, if if you have like four value sequence. I don't know what that means. I mean. So is so it like this n side sequence? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have like you can give those and, four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can you can you can give uh, inference rules for I mean I suppose you can uh even this is on me to bring the technical mm -hmm. thing, but it seems doable to uh, to uh, to axiomatize that to give a sequence like an inference rules for that are pure for um, mm -hmm. for at least for example. Yeah. And of course, the so the, the technical realization would be 
motivated by the fact that we know that there is a matrix, a matrix semantics that works. But I think it can be philosophically justified uh, also uh, um, by, I don't know, uh, by have diff different kinds of inferences or, and uh, at least you could, if, if you can make sense philosophically of, of those like four-sided sequence, in purely in inferential terms, mm -hmm. then you would have an inferential, like a, a, a kosher, so to speak, uh, Way to look at uh, as, at FDE as a as a, as a logic with like meaningful mm -hmm. connectives and not just like a purely al algebraic uh, game. Yeah, I think um, I don't know if you know this paper by Ulo Hortland um, from 2014, where um, so there is definitely multilateralism in the title. Okay, no, I don't. That's know. why. Um, yeah, one of the few papers wh which I came across, uh, with, which is about multilateralism, and I think, if I understood it correctly, this is exactly the point that he's making. I think he's doing it for, right? You can give a three-sided sequence characters for K three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think he used this yeah. example. Yeah, and um, I mean, this is and this is fine for me, and it's also fine for me, to be honest, to call this multilateralism. For me, this is also a form of multilateralism. But, um, like, minor point that um, we also criticized in this paper I mentioned was like, okay, still, if you're coming from true theoretic semantics, this uh, paper by Hoffman is um, quite, like, traditionally semantically motivated. And like maybe if you want to like have a stronger proof theoretical argument for this, then yeah. The, but that was um, basically the sum of it. But um, yeah, we this the motivation for this was really basically also um, because there you also have this congruentiality uh, breaking and. Um, that you can uh, secure this with um, different forms of sequent errors and then also uh, retain uniqueness and so on. So that was a bit like yeah. philosophical motivation to go for this system. And I'm not saying this is the only form of my philosophy. <laughs> Heinrich is maybe saying this. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick follow-up. Uh, so, so it seems to me that, 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 of course, I mean, it's possible that really came from a, from a matrix point of view, uh, uh, but I mean, this shouldn't be an argument against it being proof theory, uh, how it's, where it comes from, or how it was originally conceived. Um, if you take seriously bilateralism, and uh, look at it as uh, attitudes, uh, then having the attitudes of, um, of indeterminacy or something like that in the case of K3 or uh, the case of FDE, you could have the attitude of uh, being in contradiction, being uh, so conflicted about the proposition, let's say, or being uh, 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 in doubt about to, to say that the, the neither uh, true value uh, uh, being uh, positive about it and being negative about it, something like that, uh, you could you could just generalize to to the whole matrix of of of, of FDE, the four valued matrix, and then not, why not go further? Uh, I mean, uh, of course, we use these matrices uh, uh, for like some traditional semantics, but there is nothing, um, I mean, that's just the inspiration. You could see that as pure, uh, 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 if you involve these attitudes in your proofs, that becomes proof theory just like anything else, except with multiple sides or, uh, or signs. Uh, you might have the true value as a sign to, uh, at sign, not just true and uh, uh, plus and minus, but uh, like uh, uh, true, false, both, and neither as sign. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there is nothing more uh, 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 model theoretic about that. Uh, um, it's just as proof theoretical and as uh, inferentialist and so on. Um, 
but just a broader spectrum of, of ways of thinking about a proposition than just uh, accepting or rejecting. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if you want to... <laughs> Maybe I, I want to help you here. <laughs> uh, so I think this is where the difference between signing the conclusion, the consequence and signing the formulas matters. Because, uh, so the kind of view seems like that you're proposing generalizes from, I mean, I can understand very well generalizing from the Rumfit style. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's kind of easy to see how it works if you add attitudes to propositions. You can say, well, I can, yeah, I can have the attitude of being like, I want to say yes and I want to say no at the same time, or I just want to say yes. And, but it's much harder to, uh, to apply those signs to, at, at least on my intuition, to apply those signs to consequent relation. And your, your, your side in this debate is, uh, is, is, is look, even though I, I, I was a bit resistant, but your view, your official view seems to be that the primitively the sign belong to the consequence. Yeah. So yeah. this game could not be played as easily, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. I mean, th this would have been somewhat also a bit my the attitudes that you mentioned, um, I mean, this is like, okay, this is like this one form of bilateralism, but as I said in the beginning, this is not really what we are right, um, right, right. Yes, 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 yes. pausing here. And also maybe I had, I mean, um, this, uh, my, my answer was maybe not really to you, but to this Portland paper, which I had in mind, um, where he's really con concerned about um, showing that then for these proof systems the categoricity uh, problem doesn't apply or something like that. And that's very, for me, that's very um, coming from model theoretic point of view because mm. why are you concerned with the categoricity problem? <laughs> 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 Not, like, you know what I mean? Maybe that, that was, um, that was then, uh, more of a response to this having in mind and um, Categoricity sounds very much like uh, uniqueness and fair facts, uh, no? Yeah, sure, but from the model theoretic side, right? Yeah, well, it might be a good inspiration to have maybe an alternative <laughs> characterization of uniqueness. <laughs> from a, I mean, if you could have a characterization that is proof theoretic of yeah. categoricity. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, okay, we can continue the discussion with the beer. So let's thank our speaker.